maths was beautiful, numbers were magic. Science is really creative and a lot of people don't realise that. You know, you solve something and you get a little kick. You're like, yeah, I did that. A lot of people will see STEM careers as this thing where you're in a lab coat and you're in a lab. I started to break down more and more the stereotype about what science is. Everyone says a doctor saves a life, but engineers build machines that save people's lives. There's a lot of careers in engineering, sustainability, renewable energy, climate change, the animal welfare, digital agriculture. And how we drive the change we want to see, that's what has been the life force behind my career. I believe it's really important for us to give back and help the younger generation and be role models and inspire them. We're developing the next generation of creators, innovators and change makers. You know, we very quickly move from a it's impossible to it is absolutely possible. I'm an entrepreneur. General Manager of Sustainability. Marine Systems Ecology. Senior Research Scientist. Robobiologist. Manager of Systems Engineering. Chemical Engineer. CTO and Co-Founder of Mimic Tech. What could be more interesting than understanding life itself? Hello everyone and welcome to today's Della event all about smart materials of the future. Now, firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land which I'm on today, the Gadigal people, as Australia's first scientists and engineers and technologists, and pay my respects to elders past and present, and also encourage you, our audience, to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land you are currently on. Now, my name is Claire Frugia, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager at Science Gallery Melbourne and today we are going to be hearing from and asking questions of two exceptionally creative, innovative and may I say inspiring engineers, Professor Madhu Baskaran and Associate Professor Matthew Hill. But before we do that, we want to hear a bit about our audience today, um, you guys. So, in a moment, you will see a poll pop up on your screen asking you what grade you are in, what year of school are you in. Um, answer that one, and this will help us structure the next couple of hours together. So, while you're doing that, an event like this is only made possible uh, thanks to Stella, which is a program from the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering. Now, the aim of Stella is pretty simple. It's to show you just how many opportunities there are in science, technology, engineering, and maths. And by doing so, inspiring students like yourselves to choose science and engineering careers, because what we know at the moment is that there is a shortage of science and engineering graduates and a whole world of interesting, fascinating careers out there. Now, if you ever need a shot of inspo about your future career, you can jump over to the Stella website. There are career profiles and interviews of real people working passionately, creatively, and purposefully in careers of all disciplines. So think renewable energy, sustainable housing, climate change, future health, biomedical engineering, all these big challenges for the futures. STEM careers are at the heart of them. Um, but that is for later. Um, right now, it's time to hear from our engineering superstars. So let me give some bios for them. So Madhu Baskaran is a professor of electronics engineering at RMIT University, where she co-leads a team that are constantly, and I love this, trying to bring science fiction to reality. Amazing. Madhu is an electronics engineer and innovator, and her focus has been on creating and translating the next generation of electronic devices. So think something as thin as a Band-Aid, but is also, you know, comfortable on your skin. Madhu has won many awards for her research, including medals from Australia's leading academics, um, and was also named among Australia's most innovative engineers 
by Engineers Australia. And we also have with us today, Associate Professor Matthew Hill, who is an Australian Research Council Future Fellow and winner of the Australian Prime Minister's Prize for Science incredible. Um, Matthew leads an interdisciplinary team of researchers at Monash University and the CSIRO who work with industry to bring exciting discoveries from the laboratory into our lives. So think things like a device that can capture carbon dioxide directly from the air but also be quite low in cost or a battery that can store up to five times the amount of charge as you have on your phone right now. And I mean, who wouldn't want that? Or a mask that can protect you from every possible hazard for many hours. And I feel like 2020 is the year to create that. Um, so I think you get it now. You're in for a treat. Um, and for everyone watching, remember this is question and answer. This isn't just talk at you. So make sure you go and um, click on the question button um, on your screen, which is a little hand up and add your questions for Madhu and Matt in the chat and we'll get to them afterwards. Um, so without any further ado, I am going to hand over to Madhu. Good morning, everyone. And this next 10 minutes of my presentation will focus a little bit on my research journey. So just to talk a little bit about you know where my research started where the motivation for a lot of the work which we do today is and how it's agreed, actually progressed along the years so i lead the functional materials and microsystems research group at rmit university uh, that's a mouthful for the name for the research group but as you can see in the slide over here we do quite a lot of things the most fascinating things about materials is you know when you take materials at a much larger scale and then when you scale them down to much smaller scales, they behave very, very differently. And that's what we're hoping to actually capture and you know, use that for various, various applications, which has not been imagined before. So we take materials, we use them at the micro scale and the nano scale, which is at really tiny scales. And then we use their properties at those scales to find new applications. Now that could be in quite a wide variety of areas, starting from very, very thin materials, which could be the future electronic devices, which you might hold, say, 20 years from now. It could be devices which, you know, work towards manipulating light, and therefore you're talking about future drone technologies, automated cars, and things like that. Or it could be along electronics which can mimic the brain. And how fascinating is that? A brain is something which is quite something which, you know, people have not been able to crack as to how it works so seamlessly and yet is very, very energy efficient. And then there's obviously the path where I'll be talking more about today, which is around wearable technologies. So how can we take all these materials and create the wearable technologies for the future? So what you see in that slide over there, and for a lot of the audience members who are sitting there today, a lot of these things may, may be things you've never seen in your life because they were all things which were there well before you were actually even born. So if you look at the word wearable technology, a lot of people think it's a very current thing. It's something which has only lasted for say the last 10 years. But then in the true essence of the word, uh, wearable technology has been there for decades. So if you think about watches which used to exist back in the 70s, there used to be watches which also used to have calculators embedded within them. In a sense, that is wearable technology. Hearing aids, which you know again, again existed back from the 80s, is once again wearable technology in the true essence of the word. So what we wanted to see is the progression for this timeline, which I show you on this slide. How do we make sure that we keep progressing this technology, but making it more and more wearable? If you look at them, a lot of those things are still clunky. They are not as wearable. They are still they're flexible, but they are not unbreakable. And I think in some sense, that was where the motivation for our work started. So what we wanted to do was take electronics and create the next generation of electronics, which is unbreakable. So it's not just wearable, but it's most importantly, it's unbreakable. You're all watching me through a mobile phone or through a computer or a tablet today. And if you look within it, you'll find conventional electronics sitting within that. So chips, silicon chips, which have been the powerhouse for the entire electronics industry for many, many decades, are what actually power a lot of the devices which we use today. They are obviously much, much thinner, but they're still very, very fragile and they're still breakable. Now within these electronic devices, you'll also find what are called oxide layers, 
Now, oxides are basically glass-like materials. And as you change the various elements which are present in the oxide, you change the properties of the oxide. So the reason I show you a stained glass over there is the color changes based on the elements within that. Similarly, when you change the elements within an oxide, you can use it for various applications. Once again, oxides are glass-like. So once again, they are brittle and you know they're not they obviously not unbreakable. On the other hand, you have things like contact lenses, which are really thin, which are very stretchable. And obviously that's not breakable. It's very mechanically pliable and flexible. So what we wanted to do was try and marry these two very different materials. We didn't want to create a new generation of materials where we are compromising on performance. We wanted to make sure we can actually take current electronics as it stands, beautiful and really, really functional, and try and see if we can use the same technology and render them stretchable and unbreakable. So that was work which we started back in 2012. It took us a couple of years to crack it or not so much crack it because you don't want to crack electronics. And once we actually found a new way in which we could do this, we managed to develop what are called transparent but unbreakable electronics. Now, as you can see in those images over there, it's electronics which you can stretch and flex and bend and they still are functional. If we were doing this face to face, now would be the time when I would actually send a little sample around and you know, allow you to have a feel of the actual material so you get an understanding of what I'm talking about. But if you can see it over here, it's pretty much electronics as you see over here. Contact lens type material, this has electronics embedded within it. But as you can see, I can bend it, I can flex it. It's very much like the Band-Aid, which Claire spoke about initially. Here's one more image for you, just to allow you to imagine that a little more. So as you can see, the person's interacting with the skin-like layer over there. It's actually very similar to skin and its properties as well in terms of you know, how mechanically pliable and flexible it is. So we thought, brilliant, we managed to get that done. It took us a couple of years, but we are there. Now, what can we actually use this for? We thought, okay, maybe we can use this as an environment sensor. Say we use this, we wear this on our skin or we put it on our clothes and we walk outside and this can tell you how much what the pollution levels outside are. We thought that's pretty useful in a lot of countries where people wear masks nearly all the time. We are new to mask wearing for the corona, but you know, people wear masks most of the time in places like China and Singapore because of pollution levels sometimes. So it's useful to have a little sensor on your skin or on your clothes, which will kind of alert you to the pollution levels. We live in Australia. You're not new to sunscreen. You've probably grown up all your life wearing sunscreen and being told to you know, put on a lot of sunscreen before you head out. So UV sensors, which is trying to monitor the amount of ultraviolet radiation which you might have, is again a very nice application. For those of you who don't know, if you have too much of UV, obviously that leads to problems like sunburn. It also leads to issues like skin cancer. And that's definitely not something anyone wants to get. And the rate of incidence of skin cancer in Australia is particularly high. So having a UV sensor which will tell you, hey, you've had too much UV for the day, go inside and put on more sunscreen, is a particularly useful tool to have here in Australia. Now, these are also things which you wear on your skin, these little sensors. So they could tell you a little bit about your own body. What's your heart rate looking like? What's your blood oxygen level looking like? What about your glucose levels? So you could have this trying to give you an, a window into the health of your own body. We thought, oh, nice applications. Obviously, all of these look really good. So we put it out there and we kind of waited for a couple of years to see, you know, which industry partner is going to come and talk to us and see if we can take it down the path towards commercialization. Took us a couple of years because we had quite a few conversations and we're trying to understand exactly which direction to take this research in. And it turns out, you know, research is funny that way. You, you kind of have all these visions and ideas about where your technology could go. And then you have people coming along and taking it along completely different directions. And so here's an example for you. So our research right now, we're working quite closely with a company called Sleep Tight and with a manufacturing partner called Sleep Easy. And believe it or not, it's going to be used for the aged care technology. And that was something I never imagined when I was actually creating this technology. I thought I never really thought this could be used for aged care. But the idea which Sleep Tight came up with was they said, it's really thin, it's really flexible. Can we put this on a mattress? You know, you have a lot of residents in an aged care facility. Overnight falls are quite a large concern. So you have people where you have concerns where people fall off from their bed. And so you want something which will kind of monitor them overnight in a non-invasive manner and still give people the information and knowledge as to whether is a person in bed or not in bed. 
and if they are in bed are they breathing okay is their heart rate okay or are there issues or concerns where you need to step in and call an ambulance now overnight the number of people who look after the residents in an aged care facility is quite low so you want to make sure that you don't disrupt their sleep as much but you still have an understanding as to exactly what's happening to the health of the person who is inside a particular room and you can intervene at the right time required now this particular work was challenging because you're no longer talking micro and nano scale devices we're now talk talking macro scale so the scale up of our technology is something which we were doing through this project so we're almost there we're now heading towards field trials which will happen in the next couple of months to 6 months the next example i was going to show you was once again towards the health monitoring so this is again by in collaboration with a company called lepis now this company told came to us saying once again we're quite interested in aged care and as you can understand if you've been reading the news over the last 6 months there's a lot of concern around residential aged care facilities the quality of life which people lead in the, within that and how you can actually enhance their quality of life we're all living living much longer lives we want to live them well we want to live them productively and how do you make sure the technology can give you a hand in making sure that you can do that So this company came along to us and said there are a lot of people where obviously with an aged care facility instead of strapping them to a therm you know putting a thermometer in them or strapping them to an ECG monitor on a day to day or a weekly basis can we have a little patch which they can wear which will just monitor their skin temperature their ECG their heart rate and their blood oxygen levels and give us warning signs when something needs to be done this particularly the case when you have a lot of people who have say dementia and those kind of issues where they don't want to particularly be constantly touched or you know be strapped on to devices to measure their health parameters so if you can put a little patch on them which will communicate signals out can we somehow get that data off them so that's a new interesting project which we just started working on for the last around 6 months and that's showing a bit of promise as well and my third and final example was going to be with an interesting project which we have at the company called Neutromics now this one's a bit different because what we're trying to do over here is trying to actually prevent disease from actually coming along now for those of you who know diabetes is obviously a disease which is quite taken over the world a lot of people are becoming increasingly diabetic and diabetes is one of those diseases which is quite closely linked to a, to your diet so what you eat over a period of say 10 or 15 years kind of controls you know as to at at what stage you might end up with diabetes yes there are, there are hereditary issues and things like that but what you eat sometimes is literally what you are so having the ability to understand how your diet is actually controlling your blood sugar levels is something which we are really interested in doing a simple example over here there is we all think chips are bad we all think ice cream is bad when we all think certain other food is good but the way each of us process that food is very very different the way a bowl of chips impacts you might be very different to the way a bowl of chips impacts me our blood glucose levels in our body reacts quite differently to the diet we take in and that is a very very personalized decision which we need to make so imagine having a patch which kind of monitors your interstitial fluid which is not your blood but it's a fluid which is sitting below your skin and the interstitial fluid also has information about your glucose levels and you constantly get information over a period of say a week or two which tells you hey you ate a bowl of ice cream that morning and guess what that did to your glucose levels you ate a bowl of chips and you thought you were being naughty but then actually that wasn't so bad because you actually exercised quite a bit after that and it wasn't really impacting your glucose levels as much so say you wear this over a period of time you get an understanding of exactly what foods are bad for you and what foods are good for you and hopefully that will allow you to make better decisions about the diet which you consume and in the long term you know lead to better health and you know well being for you I'm going to leave it at that and you know maybe hope to get some questions later on and then we can go further into this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much Madhu. That was excellent. That was incredible to hear about how um how diverse and how interesting your your research is. Um just before we head across to Matt, I've we've had one question from the audience, a very specific question uh from from Shalishwa who was asking can this new material break as in when you stretch it far it rips um and then also is it flammable breakability now the people have shown you can actually stretch this to up to say 100% and still it maintains its 
actual property as well. It, it doesn't really rip apart. I think the realistic thing to keep in mind is skin, for instance, in our body stretches by up to around 20%. So anything which you wear on your skin, if it can withstand a strain level of say around 20%, that's pretty much good enough for you to wear on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is not something which you'll envisage wearing continuously over a period of months and months. Probably the longest you would keep this on your body and it does withstand you know, water, so you can keep it on you for uh, many, many showers and baths. And mostly it's like a week when you know this kind of a thing can stick on your skin and stay there and collect data for you. Flammability is a very interesting question. I never really had actually thought about that. Uh, we looked at washability, but never flammability. So thank you for that. You know, I'm, that's something I can definitely look into. Um, that's excellent that our Brains Trust is giving you new ideas for research um, for the future. Um, and remember to keep your questions coming. And we have had some questions come through, um, which we will ask after, um, after Matt does his presentation. So uh, on that note, I will pass along to our next speaker, Matthew Hill. Good morning. Uh, my pleasure to... to uh give you a story here about a, an incredible family of materials that we've become interested in over the last 10 years in, in my group and show you uh, what we're trying to use them for. Now, these materials are, are called metal organic frameworks or MOFs for short, MOFs. And you can see a picture there of, of one of them. We've got a, a green cylinder and a blue uh, sphere and we join them together uh, in a structure and uh, it kind of looks like chicken wire or maybe uh, maybe cyclone fencing. And it's an incredibly porous material. And in fact, it's, it's kind of like a sponge. So every single atom that you put inside this porous material is an exposed surface, kind of like a sponge in your house. You soak up a lot of uh, water with all the holes that you have in there. So we have uh, a sponge on steroids here. It can soak up more and more and more of just about any particular molecule. And so if you add up all of the surface that's inside uh, one of these MOFs, you get a very, very big number. And we, we have materials that are more than 5,000 square meters of surface area in one gram of material. So what does that mean? Well, a, a soccer field is 100 meters long and it's 50 meters wide. So the surface area of a soccer field is 5,000 square meters. So, and a gram of material is about a teaspoon of powder. So if we have a, a teaspoon of this material, uh, then we have the whole uh, soccer field inside it. Uh, but of course, I'm in Victoria, so it's compulsory for me to show uh, an AFL oval instead here. So I've shown you that there, but, that uh, we have incredible uh, amount of porosity. And so the question for everyone out there is, well, what might you use this sponge for? What might you soak up with it? And then what might you squeeze out of it? And that's a question we've been asking for many years in, in my team. One of the things that has really uh, interested us is that, uh, did you know that separations is 15% of the world's electricity and 90% of the world's chemicals have catalysts inside it, inside uh, as part of their production. So 15% of the world's electricity is used to do a separation. So that's, all of the water we drink, all of the energy that we use, anytime we use a product uh, like a, a chemical or medicine, they've all gone through separation. And this costs energy to do so. And so we were wondering with these sponge materials if we could use them uh, to, to lower the energy costs uh, of doing those separations. So mineral organic frameworks were actually discovered in Melbourne by uh, Professor Richard Robson. And uh, for maybe for the teachers online, that's Naomi Robson's dad. So uh, I went to his uh, lecture one day uh, and on, on his desk in his office, he had a picture of the host of Today Tonight, the, uh, the um, tabloid news show. And I could not work out why a famous professor would have a picture of a tabloid host until I realized they have the same surname. That makes a lot of sense. But Richard, uh, he's still working in, in the laboratory today. He's about 90 years old now. He still works full time. And back in, in the late 80s, he made the first of these moths by accident, like a lot of good discoveries. And uh, you can see there on the slide what he said about it. And then essentially he was saying, these materials are really quite simple. Uh, and inside there's lots of, lots of holes there. 
And maybe we could use all of those holes to do lots and lots of different things. And after that first one was discovered, there's now more than 60,000 uh, of these materials reported. So I'd like to just show you one little story here of something that we've been trying to do with these metal organic frameworks uh, over the last couple of years. So when, uh, when we're not all dealing with coronavirus, one of the biggest problems that we face is climate change. And uh, we really need to be thinking about this problem from every possible angle. So if we just break this right down, every year we put 35 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And yet while we're busy expelling so much carbon dioxide, we're also buying carbon dioxide because we need it for lots of processes. If anyone wants to have a fizzy drink, we need that carbon dioxide from somewhere. And there's many other examples of where we use carbon dioxide and adds up to about 100 million tonnes a year. So we thought just as a start, what if we could get that CO2 from the air instead of from somewhere else? That might be a good idea. So we designed a, a machine and we call it Airfina. And uh, inside of this machine, we have about nine kilograms of moss inside there. And what those moss can do is work like a sponge. We blow air through and we can soak up just the carbon dioxide and we let everything else go past. We let the nitrogen, the oxygen, the water, argon, any other chemicals that might be in the air, we let them go past and we just capture the carbon dioxide. And this little machine, can uh, it's, it's about a metre high and a metre wide. It does the same job as 20 trees might do. But also it gives us that carbon dioxide uh, to use for something else at the same time. So when we were doing this, we just wanted to know really, could you do it? And the next question was, well, should you do it? So just inside the box here, um, this is how it works for, for the engineers in the audience that might be curious. We have nine uh, absorption columns. So these are big steel tubes filled up with moss in a, in a very special way and it it's, uh, would take me too long to talk about how we do that. And what happens is that it takes 40 minutes to fill those tubes up with carbon dioxide and blowing the air through. Once they're full, we close them off, we put a, connect a vacuum up and do this all automatically and it takes about 20 minutes to pump the carbon dioxide out. So because it takes twice as long to fill up as empty, what we do is we have six of the tubes being filled and three of the tubes being emptied at any one time. And that means that there's always carbon dioxide going in and always carbon dioxide going out. So that's, that's the science, but how do you do that? How do you go through that long journey to make that box at the end? And this slide here shows you um, the journey we've been on. Been on. We created a, a little company for ourselves, which we call Mothworks, and we're very interested to make a lot of different um, products. And the first product is this Airfina, and you can see all of the steps that we've had to go through here. We started off looking at a computer, working out is this even possible, and if so, which of the thousands of moths might be the one that works. And then we went and made some of them, and then. We did some little tests and some slightly bigger tests and bigger and bigger again. And then finally, we we're able to build the full prototype. And so that's the journey that, that we've taken this technology on. Big question, of course, is how much does it cost? And we saw when we started this, oh, this would be way too expensive. Um, today, if you want to buy in a lot of carbon dioxide into Australia, it, you'd pay about $300 for every tonne. Now, for us, the, the main cost is um, the electricity that it takes to run our system, but we could put this anywhere out in, outside. So we can use solar power, and if we do that, we can get down to around $100 a ton instead of $300 a ton. And if we can use waste heat, it could get even lower again. So that was the first big thing that we we're excited about. The next question was, well, how do you get your hands uh, on enough of this moth to actually use it? There's 60,000 moths that are known. Uh, if you want to go and buy some, there's only about seven that are available, and each of them has a totally different lab set up uh, to, to make that moth. So who knows if that's the right moth for us? Probably isn't. So we were thinking, how do we use our knowledge of engineering to make a versatile system uh, that could make any moth? And 
for those who are chemical engineers, that they're always interested in trying to use what we call continuous processes. So these are um, systems that you can set up and they just run and run and run. And uh, when it comes to making MOFs, we wanted to use a process called continuous flow chemistry. And we were very curious if it might work. So usually when you make a MOF, you, you make up a, you get a big beaker and you mix the chemicals in and you have to mix the exact right chemicals in the exact right way. And then you wait a couple of days and these beautiful crystals start to form in your beaker at the bottom. But what if I want to make tons and tons and tons of them? That takes too long. So continuous flow chemistry is about doing this chemistry in a pipe instead of inside a beaker. And it turned out that when we did this, and we still don't exactly know why, which is always the fun with research, is that a lot of stuff you don't quite understand. Uh, the time to do this went from 24 hours to one minute. And the materials that we were making are still really high quality. So we were super excited about this and we wondered if this was the way to make enough moth to make our air scene machine work. So here's the journey that we took that on. We started on the left here, we've got a little baby flow reactor and you can see on the top there some little blue solutions. So this one uh, was a moth that had copper in it, which is blue when you dissolve it up. And uh, we passed that through our pipes and we could make 40 grams per hour of the moth through that. Really, really exciting given that I couldn't even make one gram before. And then we bought a slightly bigger machine and we got to 400 grams per hour as well. And then on the right here, we built a, very, a larger one that gives us up to 10 kilograms per hour. And we did all of this in our laboratories. But at this stage, this is too much for us now. We're, we're engineers, we're working in the lab. And the next stage is to actually work with a company. And so on the last slide here, I'll show you a picture just from the last couple of weeks uh, from the work we're doing with a company that's here in Melbourne in a, in a suburb called, called Noble Park, and their name's Boron Molecular. And they specialise in using continuous flow chemistry to make just about any chemical. And the photo on the left there is our metal organic framework lab, and they're now busy making around 100 kilograms uh, of metal organic frameworks every week. So it's my pleasure to give you an overview, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Madhu and Matt, for giving us a first-hand insight into your materials research. Um, and it's just incredible to hear how impactful your research will be on our lives from a uh, from a health perspective and also from a climate change perspective. Um, we've been we've been inundated with questions for the both of you. Um, I'm going to start though by asking a question that actually came through yesterday from Tanil, who is a year five student. Um, and Tanil has asked, what are some strategies you use to stay focused when you are trying to create different pieces of technology? So how do you stay focused when you're inventing new pieces of technology? Um, Madhu, maybe we'll start with you. That's a fascinating question, actually. Um, sometimes focus is the way to go. And I think when we work with industry, it's quite easy to stay focused because they help you stay on track with you know, milestones and very specific deadlines to meet. So it's kind of hard to run away in different directions when you're working with industry towards an end goal. When we're doing our initial project, though, it's quite easy to get uh, pulled away into different directions. And I think having a group which works together, diverse people who work together, and constantly staying on track of exactly what the end goal is and therefore how we are working towards that is something which we try and do. But having said that, you know, a lot of our discoveries have come from not being so focused. So sometimes our mistakes are, are, are literally our Eureka moments. Like, for instance, the thing where I mentioned, you know, we, we did the transfer process where we managed to marry two very different materials. It was literally a mistake which actually resulted in it. It just happened. We forgot to deposit one of our thin film layers. And then we resulted that lack of that particular layer helped us, you know, develop a transfer process and allow us to come up with a, me me a mechanism to combine these two. So it's funny where, you know, sometimes uh, Eureka moments can come out of, you know, not, not necessarily a lack of focus, but just going off the, you know, plant path. 
but uh, typically it's it's a group thing where we work together we document quite a bit and we make sure that we hopefully can reach towards our end goal in a straight line with not too many side paths um excellent i'll go across to matt now but i'm going to ask um lucy's asked a question and that is when did you discover what moths were uh, when did I first discover them? That's a, that's an interesting question. You know, that I probably first discovered, uh, found out about them in about 2006, and uh, I was reading uh, some some of the latest reports of of scientific breakthroughs, and uh, moths were being just suggested at that time that maybe they could be used to store hydrogen, and maybe uh, we could put moths inside a car. And put, and then we could power our car on hydrogen. And I was really fascinated by that. And when I read all the detail inside about how moths are formed and and uh, what goes into all the science and the engineering underneath, it turned out that I had just done all of that at, at, at university when I was a student, um, but for a completely different application. And so um, that kind of underlines what Madhu just said about you need to be focused but not focused because. Um, I would not have made that connection that what I did previously could help in a totally different field, but uh, that's what happened. Um, I'll stay on you, Matt, because I have a couple of other questions um, specific. Um, uh, Steve has asked, is it possible to soak up one substance and not another like oil out of the ocean so a couple of questions around sort of like you know what what are some other applications that these can be used for oh those are uh, those are just fantastic questions and the answer to both of them is yes so to just give you a bit more detail uh, i have a, a friend he works in in america his name's praveen and praveen is um, developing moths to soak up exactly that nuclear waste uh, he's looking at gas types of nuclear waste, gaseous nuclear waste, uh, and he's been very successful uh, in doing that. And so he's at a similar stage to me where he's trying to make a product that he can use to do that. Uh, when it comes to soaking up oil, that's actually something that, that my team has been working on. I just didn't talk about it today. So great, uh, great question. Uh, when it comes to, we all know that oil and water don't mix, and that's true, but it's also not true. So when you get down to very, low amounts of oil, it will actually mix in the water. So you can get most of the water out first, got most of the oil out of the water, but the last bits of oil are really hard to get out. And so we've used some of these materials to be very selective to just take the, the oil out and not the, not the water. Uh, and we've, we've been working with a company called Suez who are, are very interested in, in that kind of technology. All right, Madhu, we've got a couple of questions. Um, the first one is from Pravakash, who uh, wants to know what type of materials would you use to make your technology so flexible? So the underlying material is a contact lens type material. So the one which I showed in the, in the slides over there is basically a contact lens type material. It's silicone rubber. So you know, if you play with silicone putty or, or with uh, things which you know bend and flex a lot, it's very similar to that. Uh, people also use plastics, so it's a so it's a combination of some kind of a polymeric material, which is what makes it so stretchable and flexible. Uh, things like silicon, which is the workhorse of the industry, is not obviously flexible or stretchable, but that is an electronic material which comes with its own set of wonderful properties. So we use this as the base, and then on top of this, we have various functional layers. Now, those are layers which are accustomed for a particular application. So if you want to sense pressure, you might use a particular layer. If you want to sense, uh, say, the UV, then you might use choose to use some other layer on top of it. And then you have your metal layers, which collect the information off from the sensor and pass it on to the device, which is giving you that information. Um, and we have one more question around this, and that's um, Ashton, who is specifically thinking, you know, into the future, when when can this wearable technology, when will it be ready to buy commercially? People are very excited, Madhu. <laughs> I get this question all the time, and I think over the years, my uh, my, op my answers are getting probably a little more realistic. 
Uh, so with the aged care one, which I mentioned, where we're putting it within mattresses, we're hoping that will be very, very soon. Like I mentioned, we are going into field trials in the next couple of months. So we're hoping that will hit the market in, say, in a year's time or so. With the other smaller devices, obviously, industry would like us to get there a lot sooner. So some of the UV sensing devices, which we have, will probably hit the market in, say, a couple of years time or so. And while I'm at it, I'll actually go back to answer the previous question on flammability. Uh, my brain was obviously not working then. These are polymeric materials. So, and that in, in, a, in a way was the main problem we had to overcome, but we had to create these new layer, this new set of devices. So they're polymers, which means they burn at around 100, 100 degrees centigrade. So they're not gonna withstand anything beyond 100 degrees centigrade, and you wouldn't really wanna push them anything beyond say 70 or 80 degrees centigrade. So that's kind of the disadvantage in some sense, but that's what keeps them mechanically pliable and flexible. Okay, so um, Matt, back to you. We've got a question from Tiana, um, who is asking, how is this machine able to only catch carbon dioxide and let all other gases go by? Yeah, that's a, a, an excellent question. And uh, the, the, the short answer is not very easily. Um, and, and the long answer is we've had to um, use a lot of, a lot of tricks to make that happen. So the, the, first, the first trick is that the metal organic framework itself, we chose one that carbon dioxide really likes to, stick, to soak into uh, and the other molecules don't so much. It's not, it's not so difficult to let oxygen and nitrogen go by and just capture carbon dioxide, but the really hard one is water. So water and carbon dioxide are very, very similar molecules in a lot of ways. And so where carbon dioxide wants to go, water wants to go. And even when it's a super dry day in Melbourne, there's still a lot more water in the air than there is carbon dioxide. If we remember, there's only about 0.04% of carbon dioxide in the air, which uh, might not sound like a lot, but if I had 0.05% of alcohol in my blood, I couldn't drive a car. So uh, the, those small amounts of molecules can do a, a lot effect uh, when, it, when it comes to it. So we've had to do some really sneaky things to not have water stay in there and they were to do with the, the structures that we used inside so that water just didn't have the time to, to soak in. It wants to but it doesn't have the time to. This is essentially how we did it. Um, that's Wow, that's excellent. So, Marju, we've got another question, and I'm just sort of I'm floored by the number of questions that are coming through. And I'm conscious we probably won't get to go through all of them in this session, but in this section, sorry, I should say, um, but we will have another question that's a section um, after the next um, after the next presentation. So, um, maybe a couple more questions. So, uh, Mitchell has asked Marju, how does the wearable tech get powered? There are a couple of options to power this. One is using technology which is similar to your credit cards. So like how you know you do your touch and pay on your systems right now. So you can put a little near field communication chip within these sensors. And then each time your phone kind of comes close to the near field communication chip or an NFC chip and interacts with it, you can gather the data of it and power it at the same time. So that's a very low, low power option where you're just interrogating the sensor as and when you need to listen to it and you get the information of it and power it at the same time. If you want to keep gathering information over a long duration of time continuously without you having to keep intervening, then you would go with the Bluetooth option, which is a little more power hungry. So batteries become a little more of an issue. So a Bluetooth or a battery option in that case is where you'll go. People are working on battery free options, but we are still a bit further away from that. And one final question for you, Matt, uh, which comes from Simone, uh, which is how many different types of MOFs did you have to test before you found the ones you wanted? Uh, which is a great question, I think, from an engineering perspective. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, so what we did was uh, in the, we did some tests inside a computer instead of having to, to go ahead and do it in, uh, experimentally. We probably tested about 100 materials in the computer. Um, the, good, the good thing is after a while, we, we're pretty good at guessing. So we guessed which 100, maybe out of 60,000 would be the ones. And then we made about 10 of those um, to find the one um, 
Although having said that, just yesterday, some of my team said, oh, I think we found a better one. We should change and use a different one. So um, the answer is always, always being updated. Um, and that segues nicely. Last question. Um, it is from a teacher. What can you both tell these students, just in a couple of sentences, um, about the importance of failures in science? <laughs> You do? Would you like to go first? No, I was going to ask Matt to go first. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, who goes first? Um, yes, failure. Uh, I probably have got more things wrong than everyone else on this, on this meeting combined um, because that's sort of what we have to do. So the, the, when you're doing scientific research, every day you're going to do something that no one in the history of the universe has ever tried to do before. So maybe it won't work. It probably won't work actually. So, so I, I probably have a success rate of about 20% uh, in the things that I try to do. And, and it is difficult to, to, to sort of get used to failing a lot. But uh, you know, there's a very famous quote from Thomas Edison that he never failed, but he just found 10 different ways that didn't work. And that's, that's what we have to think about is that even when something doesn't do what we think it should, that's not necessarily a failure. It's actually giving us knowledge and information. And, I do mention that earlier about some of her best discoveries coming from that. And if she wasn't such a good engineer, maybe she would have classed that as a failure rather than as an exciting moment. And, and that's the way we try to think about it. It's not all bad news. <laughs> Marjorie, do you have Matt, anything to add? The, yes, Matt kind of stole a lot of my lines. but um, <laughs> And I think the 20% or one in five was exactly the number which I use all the time as an example. You know, we have five things going four things eventually don't end up going the way we wanted them to go and one of it does and that is, should be enough to keep you optimistic and keep you feeling happy and i think that's the other thing as well when you plan an experiment and it goes exactly as it planned you know in the early stages of a career that's really exciting because you think you you can really predict really well but you kind of then understand a lot of discoveries in science and engineering and technology is actually when things don't go as they predict and that's where the real, you know, the discovery actually really happens only at that kind of point. So, you know, when you obviously progress through your career, you sometimes get more excited when things don't go as they planned. Um, excellent. Well, I think that is an, uh, an excellent place to leave our question and answer um, section here. Um, so, for our audience, remember to check in the resources tab um, for more information, um, more information on Stella, and also um, the Science Gallery, more information about Science Gallery in Melbourne as well. Um, and we will be back very soon after this video um, with the next section where Madhu and Matt are going to talk a bit more about their career pathways. And, um, and their high school experiences. So stay tuned for that. When I finished high school, I actually didn't really know what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a teacher or a politician or a counsellor. High school, I was just not a particularly great student. I actually didn't do very well in my A-levels, so I didn't get to go to university. I took a year off and then I went to a polytechnic, which is a much more practical learning experience. I didn't relate to science because I couldn't see myself being a scientist. I did have one teacher say to me that I'd never do anything related to science. And um, usually when someone tells me that I can't do something, it usually gives me the incentive to actually want to do it. Biology was my favourite subject, but I just wasn't very good at it. I started thinking maybe, you know, science isn't the right area for me, but I guess the reality is there are so many different avenues, different parts of science. It doesn't all have to be looking through a microscope. I would never want anyone to get put off looking at STEM subjects because they don't like maths or they don't like what they've learned, you know, traditionally at school. The way we look at STEM now is that it's literally through everything. The STEM subjects are essentially the fundamental ones for changing the world. Science and engineering themselves are so evolving and iterative that we probably don't even know what the careers in science and engineering of the future look like. You sort of have this idea in high school that you're going to pick something to study and that's what you'll do and you make that decision. The reality is opportunities come up, you need to keep your eyes open and see what's out there. So I did actually spend a lot of time reading through 
the, the job prospectuses and reading about every certain job that was out there. I spent time at the universities researching what courses were available to study. My mum wanted me to be a doctor. I really don't want to be around too much blood day to day. And when I went to a few open days at some universities, I learned about biomedical engineering. Well, that's a really cool way to apply engineering to the human body. I didn't always think I'd be a scientist. I took a break, actually. I decided I actually like art. Um, and I went to art school. After a year of doing art school, I just felt like, no, it, it's actually science. It's a great thing to just think, I really like this, try it, and it's fine to change. So I'm really glad I pursued my passion because clearly I've been able to have a great career with what I was interested in doing. Hello everyone. It is good to be back for the second session of the Stella Victorian Enrichment Series, looking at smart materials of the future. Now, in this next section, we will hear from our uh, wonderful engineers, Matt and Madhu, again, um, not about their research this time, but how it is they got to be where they are today, what their high school interests were um, and where their career paths have taken them. Um, now, remember, just like earlier, we value your questions and you've been so great at putting some excellent questions into the chat. So keep them coming and we will answer as many as we can. Um, yes, yeah, so without any further ado, let us jump right into it and I'm going to pass across to Matthew Hill. Great, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, so it's my pleasure now to, to, I guess, well, maybe not so much a pleasure to talk about myself, but uh, I'm very happy to, to, to take you on uh, the journey that, from where I used to be when I was a kid to where I am today and to give you a sense of, of how people go uh, about making that that path there and, and you can see a photo of me there this was from uh, it, when I was working in the lab over Christmas uh, and uh, we uh, had some chemical vapors present uh, so uh, I uh, had all of the gear on unfortunately that day so firstly um, here is a this is a photo of my team that we, we took last year and uh, you might notice that our team uh, has people from all the different parts of the world and there's about the same number of men and women in the team. And that's really important to us, that we have a, a diverse team. And further than that, you can't see it in the picture, but these people are from all the different types of science and engineering. So we've got chemists and chemical engineers, mathematicians, physicists, biologists, electrical engineers, lots of different types of skills in one team. And so that's another thing that we know these days in, in uh, technology is that we really want to have a blend of different skills and uh, maybe the days of the one brilliant um, professor with a pen and paper sitting in a room uh, writing brilliant discoveries, those days are gone now. It's more about teams working together and, uh, and what we can achieve. So where did I start? Well, uh, I grew up in Sydney, uh, but please don't hold that against me. Um, my family actually came to Australia on the first fleet in 1788. So um, for someone who's not Indigenous, I've been, my family has been here about as long as you possibly can, yet none of them ever went to university. Uh, so if there's anyone who's interested in science, but you don't have a, a family history of people working in science or engineering, it doesn't matter, that's fine. Um, and also, uh, yeah, we weren't exactly having uh, too much money. I, I know my mum used to have trouble um, being able to, to buy enough food for us each week, but that didn't stop us going and doing well at school and, and at university. So uh, my principal used to say to me, don't let your postcode uh, decide your dreams. So if you want to do something, it's yes, it is harder if you don't have uh, all the advantages that others might, but it doesn't stop you um, and you, you can keep going. So for me, I was always interested in science and engineering um, I, the worst story I ever hear is that when I was a, about three, um, 
if I behave myself, the reward that I wanted for being a good boy was that I could do some math. Um, so that's a pretty nerdy thing, let's be honest, that when you're three, that you want to do maths. But that's the way I was. Um, so I'm still a nerd today, um, and, and that's the way it goes. I liked chemistry, physics, and maths at school, uh, and so I went uh, on further with those. Um, I finished, uh, when I finished year 12, I was lucky to get into uh, the University of New South Wales, which is one of the big unis up in, in Sydney. Uh, and I, I actually did um, a, a chemistry degree originally. And these days I'm probably more of an engineer, but I actually originally did um, my university degree in chemistry. So that means I'm doing lots of subjects, learning how to make things. And, and on the side, I was doing things like maths and chemical engineering to, to understand those. And I was just going to go to university for three years. That's all I was ever going to do. And then I was going to go out and get a job. Um, and then I did a research project. And uh, I do mention there about how the unexpected results can be the super exciting ones. I had a few of those. So then I thought I'd stay around. Um, and so then I did a PhD, which was um, three years of, of those kinds of unexpected, uh, exciting discoveries. And I was working in new types of computer memory. And uh, then um, towards the end of that, that time, I was lucky enough to get a job uh, with the CSIRO. And you can see on the left there, I've been working there, that they're Australia's National Science Agency. I've uh, been around for 104 years now. They are uh, the inventors of Wi-Fi, a huge discovery. And the typical one for us right now uh, the company CSL, who uh, probably, if there is a vaccine that's to come out, they will make it. They were started at CSIRO and right in the same building where I work, all, all of the trial vaccines that we hear about in the news, the, the small amount of those have been made at CSIRO. So I'm very excited to work there. But I was always interested in, in um, teaching and learning. And so uh, a couple of years ago, I was lucky enough to take a joint position with with Monash University in chemical engineering, and I'm learning off them every day. So one of the things people often ask is, what do you actually do in a job like this? So here's some of the, some of the things that we do. Um, these days, I seem to sit on, on Zoom meetings all the time, and a lot of that is talking with, with other scientists and other engineers about the work we're doing and trying to understand uh, what the results that we have actually might mean. Um, and we're very interested in working with people in industry to help them to create new jobs and new products and, and uh, help our economy uh, to transition to, to uh, new technologies that will make everyone's lives better. And uh, we also then talk with other scientists and write out our work uh, so that other people know that what we did. And when I get time, I still try to go in the lab and do some experiments, but these days, my team often say, Matt, please don't come in the lab. Uh, you're a bit uncoordinated. Um, you don't come in often enough. And if it's okay with you, we'll do, we'll do the lab work for you. So uh, maybe some of you are thinking about, well, do I want to do this? Um, how, what are the sorts of questions that I might, I might think about? So the most important one is, do you think that science or engineering is fun? That's the most important by, by a long way. Uh, and being good at it, that's that's kind of important. But you know, if you really try hard, that's probably more important. Um, and you need to be curious about things. So you've heard from us today about lots of things happening that we weren't expecting. And if you weren't curious, maybe you wouldn't have picked those up. So being curious is is important. Problem solving, inventing, those are good things too. Setting your own goals. Um, this type of job is not usually a nine to five job and you just go and do what your boss says, you kind of set your own rules, which some people love, and it's, but it's not for everybody as well. Okay, so you've decided that you want to be a scientist or engineer. How do you do well at this job? So the, the first thing um, is to try to be really good at what you do. So never forget that, that um, that's the main thing is that Whatever field you choose and that you might be interested in, have fun and all of that, being very proficient and competent and good at your job is the most important thing that you can do. And I've got some photos there of some 
Australian scientists who have been fortunate enough to meet across the journey who are all incredibly good scientists and I can talk about them for a very long time but I won't do that today. The second, the second tip to, to doing well is to have good mentors and people love to help and give advice and if you're someone who can, who can uh, find the right mentors they will help you a lot and almost all of my success that I've ever had are due to these three people uh, Robert Lamb up the top there was my uh, PhD supervisor. He has also um, ran the Australian Synchrotron here. Uh, Anita Hill hired me at, at the CSIRO and she went on to become the Chief Scientist of CSIRO. And Cathy Foley here is currently the Chief Scientist of CSIRO. She was in my mother's knitting class when I was about five. That's how long I've known Cathy for. Okay, so the next, the next thing to think about is don't be afraid to work with industry. So to translate your science, to, to take it through, test it out, test those experiments you've done to see if they can be useful to someone. And I really hope that more people in Australia get good at this because Australia is really bad as a country at this. So that, that's also an opportunity that if you're good at working with industry, you can really uh, do well. The fourth tip is that people skills are really crucial. I think I just mentioned that earlier. You don't want to be like Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory. You need to be able to work with other people and, and um, be able to understand and respect what they have to say. And the final one is, uh, is that diversity. And I mentioned that at the start, that you want to be around lots of different people who are not the same as you. Uh, the last thing my team needs is another Matt Hill in the team. We already have a Matt Hill. Um, we don't need another one who's just going to agree with him all the time. So the best thing that my group do is when they come to me and say, actually, you were wrong, you made a mistake, maybe we need to rethink this. And that, that's a really valuable uh, thing to have. So I'll just leave it there with, with my favourite quote from Linus Pauling, who won two Nobel Prizes. And he said, in order to first have, have a good idea, you must first have a lot of ideas. So if you have a lot of ideas, you've probably got a good idea in there. So thanks and I'll be happy to answer your questions uh, in a few minutes. Thanks so much, Matt. And uh, I love that you are leading the charge to reclaim the nerd name. I am 100% um, on board with this and I think it's a worthy cause. Um, so there are a lot of questions that are coming through. I'm just going to ask you one. Um, sure. before we go on to uh, Marju's presentation. And that um, was, was there ever a time of your life that you doubted yourself? And that's come through on the Q&A. Oh, probably every day. Yeah, absolutely. So um, probably the most, that was probably at university. I, um, lots of people can be the smart kid at school and you're doing well there. But when you get to university, everyone's super smart. And, and you know you might doubt well am I actually um, really up to the up to this uh, this career but uh, what I learned I guess was that the most important thing was did I really like doing it because if I if I did and found the interest I would I would find a way to succeed which ultimately I did even though I, I probably wasn't sure that I could uh, I got uh, probably got 51 percent in my first year uh, at uni just got across the line but by the end I was doing a lot better than that so it's perfectly normal to be doubting yourself. Thanks again, Matt. Um, now, uh, I, I guess let's pass over to Madhu um, to hear about your STEM journey and, um, and you know, what, what's led to you being in the career you are today. Thanks, Claire. And uh, thanks, Matt. That was fascinating, actually. Um, so I'll talk to a little bit about my own STEM journey now. And so if my name hasn't given it away already, I'm from India. So I I'm not, I wasn't born and brought up here in Australia. I came to Australia only in 2004, and that was when I was 21. So I, I was born in India. And if you can see a map over there, you can see a place called Chennai, which is highlighted quite in bigger words. And that's previously used to be called Madras. So that's where I was born and brought up. And that's where I did my schooling as well. So that... As, as you can see over there, I went to a girls' school. And even though it's a girls' school, there are a few boys in there. We did have a few boys until year five, and then we chased the boys away. But um, that's predominantly a girls' school. And if you're wondering where I'm sitting, I'm 
uh, again, I would say a bit of a nerd. So that's me next to the teacher on the left hand side of her. So predominantly, you know, stuck to the teacher, stuck to, you know, uh, doing things, which uh, I was, I wouldn't say I was a very sporty child who was running around and doing a lot of things. I liked other sources of entertainment, but, you know, I was predominantly into education and studying and things like that. Now, I was a daughter to two medical doctors, and both my parents obviously have always had the ambition that I will also turn out to be a doctor. And so much that when I was three, when people asked me what my name was, I used to say I'm Dr. Madhu. So I just assumed that I would be a doctor. They assumed I would be a doctor. But that was until probably until I was around 12 when we got our first computer in the house. So what do you see over there is the first computer we ever got in our house. It was an Apple computer. And uh, the one, the image next to that is actually of a game called SimCity. And I spent hours, afternoons, days, weeks, many, many months playing this game. It was just fascinating for me that I could create a whole new city, create elements which go into the city, destroy the city, and then build it up all over again. So. It was, I think it was just fascinated that here's a thing, which is a computer, which, you know, it's, it's not like a TV, you can control it. It does so many fascinating things, which you never really thought it could actually, you could actually do before within the comfort of your own house. The other thing which also sparked my interest was the telephone. So if you see over there, you can see the telephone, which I used in the 80s, which was when I was just born and growing up. It was a telephone which was hooked to the wall, which had a dial, which you had to use to dial the numbers. And it had a little cord by which you could pick up the receiver. You can't walk all over the house talking on it. You had to stay stuck to one pos particular position while you're having your conversation. And then we moved on to a cordless version where you could have the the uh, the you know the freedom to walk within the house while you're talking on your telephone. And then obviously we leaped to the 2000s when we started getting mobile phones and you don't have to be confined within your house to make a phone call or to talk to anybody. I think this was something which was really fascinating for me because it just showed you how far you can leap in technology within a span of a couple of decades to being tethered to a wall to have your telephone conversations to now being being able to go anywhere and have your phone conversations and never really be unconnected in a sense. I think it just speaks volumes for the way technology can really quite take leaps very, very quickly. Unlike, you know, where you went from the 1930s, so the telephone which you see over there at the very beginning is in the 1930s. It took almost 30 to 40 years to go from there to what you see in the 70s or 80s. But then after that, you know, technology moved and progressed quite quickly. So I guess that was kind of what sparked my interest. I thought, okay, I have these fascinating things. The tech telephone itself, for instance, has you know gone through a couple of technological leaps just within my own childhood. What's really powering these devices? What's powering that computer, which you know in the 30s used to occupy an entire room? How did that manage to scale down and come down to just occupying a space on my little on my table? I knew there were silicon chips within it, but I didn't know much beyond that. Now, as a child growing up, I, I loved chemistry, I loved biology, and so I was furthering my parents' thoughts and dreams that I would become a doctor. But I, I, I kind of liked physics. I liked maths. I wouldn't say I loved maths. I kind of liked maths. But here's the funny thing about maths. When you grow up in India, everyone drills its importance of it into your head. Even my grandmother, who's actually not gone past year seven or year eight in her own studies, kind of used to drill it into my head that maths is really important and you need to do really well in maths. And she used to feed me special food so that I'll do well in my maths exams. So it's kind of funny because you're growing up in this system where everyone around you seems to recognize the importance of science and the importance of certain core subjects. So, you know, it wasn't very different for me to think otherwise. I just understood and kind of thought that's the norm. Now, I managed to get into both a medical school and I also got into an engineering school. And much to the disappointment of my parents, I still don't think they've got over it. I decided to become an engineer. And I said, no, and I went, obviously within engineering, there are branches and branches of engineering you can choose from. And given my fascination for the electronic devices, I chose to do electronics and communication engineering. To make matters a little bit more worse, I chose not to do it within my own city. I decided to run away to another city and do it over there. So there goes. I think I don't think my parents have still, you know, forgiven me for that. So I kind of left Chennai and I went to the city Coimbatore, which is marked there in green. And I did my engineering degree in a bachelor's, for, which was for four years in electronics and communication engineering. And that particular degree, it 
it didn't really give me practical experience and you know engineering degrees in india are quite different to the ones which are done here you get quite you, bit, you get a bit of lab experience but a lot of it is quite theoretical but i guess what it really showed me was at least pictures of silicon chips which is like the image which you see over there it kind of showed me what a silicon chip looks like it kind of showed me what how you actually make an electronic chip but i didn't really know anything about it beyond that and then came i guess the next step in my journey which was where i was thinking now should i go down the path of where i do it go away and do a job or do i then for or do i further my studies now in india a lot of people kind of go away to do it jobs when i finished up my engineering was when the it boom was kind of taking over so practically everyone was getting into an it position so going into information technology and working in one of those companies was i would say almost 80% of my entire engineering cohort stepped into an it position so it was kind of weird not to do that if they weren't going into an it position the other 10 to 15% of them were going away to the us to further their studies to either pursue a masters or to pursue a phd so 95 or 97% of them were gone in different directions but here i was and i was determined not to do either of that and i wanted to actually study further about electronics and do a little more about microelectronics so a bit like the red arrow over there i kind of ran in a different direction and i have quite a lot of people who actually were asking me aren't you heading in the wrong direction people head west and you're heading east but um, that's a decision i don't think i've ever regretted until now and i don't think i will regret that i love melbourne and i fell in love with the city when i came here in 2004 and i stayed so i came here and i got to work during my masters in microelectronics which is what i came to pursue i got to work in these labs which are called clean rooms now clean rooms are basically as the name suggests they are rooms which are very very clean so unlike typical scientific labs where you're wearing a lab coat because you are trying to protect yourself from the chemicals which you're handling a clean room is very different because you are the contaminant so when you gown up to go into a clean room you're going gowning up because you're protecting the room from you you're protecting the devices which you're making which are really really tiny from you your hair your the sweat the oil from your hands those are the ones which destroy those little devices which we make so we are the contaminants and therefore everything is actually protected from you it's kind of a different kind of a concept for a lab so that's me gowned up head to toe in a bunny suit wearing a layer of gloves wearing safety glo goggles or you know wearing face shields if i'm handling dangerous chemicals and i made my own silicon chips and i made and i tested them and i think that had me hooked just the fact that i could make my own chips and test my own little silicon chips was fascinating so i thought brilliant what do i do next and my supervisor said if you want to do this all your life you need to do a phd he lied very similar to math i've not gone into the lab for the last 6 or 7 years now my kind of my students look at me and they go uh, we we'll do the research you just tell us what to do and help us you know guide us to go along the right path so i probably made my own devices and tested them and enjoyed the joy which you get from that for around the, around 6 to 7 years and then since then i've not really gone back into the lab to actually make those devices i know how to do it but i just haven't gone back into doing it so that was me on the day of, of my graduation uh that's my thesis title which is really long and a lot of communication skills after that have taught me that um, that's probably not the most uh, title which everyone will understand so and along the journey i've obviously picked up a life partner as well so i met my husband when i was doing my undergrad and he was kind of one of the many reasons we we just traveled a uh, life together we did the same bachelor's degree we did the same master's degree and we did a phd together so we kind of had you know three graduations together which is kind of quite special and we lead our research group together now so yeah we're still doing that together just to reflect on the last i guess i finished up my phd in 2009 and just to reflect on you know things which i've been most proud of obviously i i established a research group in 2010 and and i lead that group together it's been 10 years since we established that group the group was literally just the two of us when we first established it i was the functional materials and he was the microsystems but we obviously come a long way in you know adding more and more people to the group adding a lot more research areas to the group and growing and developing that group i have a lot of interest in uh, research leadership as well so i had to con an associate dean role for 3 years 3 3 and a half years which i just finished up at the start of this year where i was trying to enhance the research environment where you know researchers come into i was rec a relatively recent phd graduate so i thought why not use my recent experiences and see how i can make it even better for young researchers to flourish within the research environment 
I had my maternity break in 2013. I went away to have my son at that point. And I think that was the point when I realized there's not too much of a support system or there was not too much happening where women could come together and talk about, you know, how your life is impacted by a career break and how you can actually have that conversations with each other. So that was when I co-founded the RMIT Women Researchers Network, which has kind of really grown, grown big now. And it's kind of now a university-wide network. I do quite a lot of work in the gender equity space, and that keeps me happy. Awards along the way for my research, they're always, always nice. And they're always, always, you know, things which boost my confidence, which we don't always have on an everyday basis. And I mentioned the gender equity, which I'm really excited to always be a national champion for. And like I mentioned in my previous presentation, actually taking that research out of the lab and working closely with industry to get the research out there, that makes me really happy. And that is something which we're really excited to be doing right now. So the journey continues as you see over there, that's me in the lab. And again, like I said, I'm not making any slides, Just that's just me over there, just making, you know, doing my usual media journey photograph. So I'm, look, I'm looking over the shoulder of my students and postdocs while they do a lot of the exciting research. And that's the photos of how the team has grown. So once again, a team which started quite small in 2010, and that's an annual photo we take every single year. We consciously try and enhance the diversity of the team. And like Matt said, with diversity comes a lot of the innovation. Having people from different cultural backgrounds, from different genders, and different thought processes to you, I think that's really critical in ensuring that the innovation keeps going and keeps going in different directions, which you never imagined it will go. So that's me. I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Madhu. It's incredible to see your journey and both you and Matt, your respective journeys, um, the challenges you face, you faced and the choices that you've made to follow your passions along the way. Um, I love especially that uh, you followed your passions despite what, um, what your parents were saying at the time. Um, I'm sure a lot of people and our audience can relate to that. Um, now we've got a lot of questions coming in from the audience. Um, Let's kick it off, and it's something that you touched on, Madhu. Let's kick it off with Katriana's uh, question, which is, do you have to have a PhD to get a job in STEM? So a PhD is probably critical if you're trying to do a job in research-based STEM, but even that I wouldn't really say, is, I wouldn't say it's critical, critical, but it's a nice to have for sure. But there are obviously jobs in STEM which don't require you to have a PhD. There are jobs which you can do in STEM, and STEM is quite broad. It's, it's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, which you can do at the back of an undergraduate degree, at the back of a postgraduate degree, or at the back of a PhD. So I don't a PhD is not critical for every STEM job. It it is critical or it's required for certain STEM jobs, which are probably more closely aligned to the research side of things. Right. Um, now we've got another question coming through from Tanil, which is, did you ever want to try a job that your friends were doing? Friends were doing or, or were yeah. doing? That your friends were doing. So maybe this question's a bit more about, you know, how much does, um, does peer pressure play into it or, you know? I think being a researcher is a really unique pathway. And I we realized, I think the time I realized that the most was when I went away on my maternity break and I came back after six months and a lot of things were exactly the way I had left them. Because in some ways, people really can't replace you. And you know, you, you bring a unique set of skills and a unique set of things into the job, which people rely on you to keep going. So it wasn't so easy to, I don't think I ever looked at others and wanted to take on their role or be them. But having said that, uh, as a career and as an academic, it's quite versatile. So I can I venture into quite a few leadership positions. I've done a lot of bit of uh, quite a lot of outreach. I've done a lot of media things, you know, where I'm talking about research to lay people and to general public. So it's quite it allows me to do a lot more things than just do my research within the lab. It allows me to be a teacher. It allows me to be a communicator, and it allows me to be a leader and also a role model for other the future generations. So I don't think I want to roll in more things within that than I've already taken on. Great. So we, we've got a couple of, question coming, couple of questions coming through about, um, you know, did, did you ever think that you shouldn't have pursued STEM? Did you ever have any doubts about it? Did you ever think engineering wasn't actually for you? Those, those sorts of questions coming through. Um, 
Matt, maybe we'll uh, start with you on this one. Yeah, look, I think these are perfectly normal things to be asking in every uh, type of career that you might be doing, to be constantly thinking about, am I doing the right thing here uh, or not? And, and if you're not having those doubts, then I would actually be more concerned that you're not really thinking through, uh, through your, your career. You know, let's remember if the retirement age is close to 70 and you'll be working in your 20s, if you do the math, that's more than 40 years that you'll be active in the workforce. So you want to be uh, doing something that that you're really interested in. But I think to just to, to maybe say what Madhu said in a slightly different way is that you're constantly changing what you're doing as well. So I know a lot of people at school now are probably thinking, boy, which, which degree should I enrol in or what subject should I do at school? But there's always flexibility. So, you know, I'm working now in an area that I never trained in uh, and I've learned uh, as part of my job. And that's very common uh, as you go along. It's a long time that you're working, hopefully. Uh, and so you, you, you're not stopping yourself from doing lots of things and the choices that you're making now. You keep learning more and more, but you will continue to learn and you can continue to change direction uh, as you get older. Okay, we've got a question from Kiki, um, which is, is it difficult to become a scientist? Which is a great question. Um, well, uh, probably to a degree, there's, there's certainly a challenge to it. But um, you know, usually the marks to get into university to just do a, a, a science degree are not that high. Uh, you, you know, then it's not easy, but you can definitely get into a scientific degree. Science, uh, you know, some people say it's incredibly hard. Others say it's incredibly easy. It really depends on which part of science and if you're naturally uh, drawn and attracted to it. There's plenty of fields of science that uh, I would be the last person you would ever want telling you about it because I'll be hopeless at it. And that's completely normal. It's a very big area. So um, if you're interested in science, you will find uh, a part of it that you find uh, at, the, at the right level for you and, and something that you're super interested in. It's a, it's a very big field. Okay, so we have a question here. Um, and this is a very specific question about uh, engineering. So maybe one for you, Madhu. So um, uh, this student wants to be able to design, then physically build, wire and code a robot or machine. Um, and they've heard this is something called mechatronic engineering. Is that is, is that good to study to be able to, to sort of achieve that aspiration? Um, they've heard it's like mechanical, electrical and software control engineering in one degree. Can you tell us a bit about that? I think with the ambition which the student mentioned, yes, mechatronics and robotics engineering definitely fits the bill for that particular one. Yeah, absolutely. So out of, out of Monash University, the Dean of Engineering is uh, Professor Elizabeth Croft, and Elizabeth is a mechatronics engineer. Uh, she has a, a robotics lab uh, that I walk past uh, when I'm on campus. So I'm always curious to see what's being driven around there. Uh, but absolutely, it's a very active field of engineering, uh, and certainly the future uh, of a lot of jobs is towards automation. So if you have the skills around that, then that's going to be something that's seen as very important. Absolutely. Um, this is a great question for the both of you um, and I think plays into, you know, you're an engineer but you're also many other different things as a, as a human being. So if this job, if the jobs that you have, um, if you did not have them, then what would you have done? Oh, Matt, go first on that one. Did you, you want to go you first, Matt? All right, I, I, <laughs> that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Uh, look, when I was at school, uh, all of my friends were rushing off to do business and commerce and accounting. I didn't want to do that. Um, maybe I would have. Um, but these days, most of my friends are in the trades of some sort. They might be a builder or an electrician or something like that. And I often say, geez, I wouldn't mind doing that job. Uh, they look at me and say, you, you wouldn't last five minutes. But um, maybe I would have. Uh, done something like that, but who knows? Do. 
So I think with me, my original plan was to come here, do a master's and then go back and get a job in industry, but working on the hardware side of things rather than the software side of things. Mm -hmm. And so if I hadn't done my PhD and got into research, that's probably what I would have done. Absolutely. I mean, um, it's, it's an important thing to note that uh, paths can change. Um, even though you might set goals, you might not know of all the opportunities that are out there when you set those goals and those paths can change along the way. Um, we've got a couple of questions about the current pandemic situation and how it's affected your work and also whether um, you've been testing out resources to help find a cure for COVID-19. So in your expertise, um, have you, have you, um, you know, been part of any research that's been, been, um, you know, around the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, and also, second part of the question, um, how's COVID-19 changed um, your research and what you do? I'll yeah, maybe okay. go first. Um, yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, so, Yes, it's uh, it's so, so just to give an insight, it's been five months and counting since I've been back at RMIT. So that, that was the last I saw my office. I've not gone back into my actual office since end of March, which was when we started going into lockdown. Um, it was difficult, but I think I realized I'm not the person who has to critically be at work right now. It's probably my postdocs and my students, which didn't happen the first half of the lockdown. So the RMIT completely shut down for the first couple of three months when we none of us could go in. And it was kind of hard because we had a lot of projects to deliver on. We had a lot of aspirations to reach to, and obviously we couldn't. But now we're operating on a much more reduced workload with uh, with COVID safe plans in place. And so it's the students and postdocs are happier and we are happier too, to see that you know things are slowly progressing again. So it's definitely impacted us. It's definitely impacted most research around the world because things are progressing at a different pace. Uh, with the question around COVID, so we make sensors, right? So a lot of the sensors which we make, we'd also, we were already studying to see if we can study, uh, do cancer diagnostics with those sensors. So we were trying to do cancer diagnostics. We were trying to study other biomarkers, like biomarkers which are present in our body fluids which indicate early onset of cardiovascular disease and things like that. So we were looking at trying to see if we can tweak the same platform to study for COVID. So we do have some ideas up our sleeve and we do have some collaborations where we're trying to see if we can either study for the presence of COVID or the presence of the COVID antibodies, which is what you would have if you've recovered from COVID. So we're, we're hoping, you know, once we get a right amount of funding, that's something we can do, or maybe not do, because people have already managed to discover a vaccine and things are progressing as they planned. So, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think my experience is very similar to Madhu's about running a lab from home. Uh, when it comes to the research, uh, yeah, it's been a crazy year. Uh, first thing that happened was my phone started ringing and people were asking if I could get some alcohol for them. And, and no, they weren't wanting to drink it, it was for the hand sanitizer. Um, we invent, we were going to try to make it in the lab, but, but it, uh, fortunately we have connections with people in industry who are able to make a lot more of it than us, and, and so we were busy helping them there. Uh, the next thing uh, that, that my team are very busy in was with masks and the technology around that. And, uh, you know, originally in Australia we had one company uh, in country Victoria working two days a week, and that was our entire ability to make masks. And now we have two companies working full time with about uh, 40 staff instead of three staff. So that's why the government um, was comfortable to, to now recommend that we all wear masks. And, and before we just didn't have the ability in Australia. Um, so some of my team uh, helped those companies out, but also, um, and it was on Sunrise two days ago on TV uh, that built a lab to test masks. So we have lots of masks being bought into Australia and we want to make sure that they all do what they're supposed to do. Uh, so that's something that we've been uh, very busy with as well. But probably the most important contribution has been uh, staying out of the way. So uh, at, at my work, we had the people that have manufactured the vaccine for um, the University of Queensland to test and it's currently being tested in Queensland and there's probably five people in the country who can do what they do and they can't afford to get sick so the rest of us have been putting a big bubble around them and no one goes anywhere near them so that they uh, can keep going and uh, what they achieved in about four months was what usually takes about five years to do so 
Uh, those are some real heroes uh, out of out of this uh, tragic uh, situation we've had. It's been the the uh, chemical engineers uh, that there's their training who've been able to manufacture these vaccines and. Boy, we hope they work, don't we? And and if they do, we'll remember that it that it started here in Melbourne. Um, great answers. Thank you so much for them. Um, now we have another question from a student at Eagle Hawk Secondary. Um, so, in recent advancements of technology, how do you think this will impact on engineering jobs? Will they be impacted, and how? Yeah. Who wants to take that first? Uh, well, that's a yeah, it's a very big question. Um, what we what we do know at this stage is, is a lot of the predictions about where the future jobs are going to be, STEM and in particular engineering is, is front and centre. So whether you actually are an engineer, I mean, it would be great to, to be an engineer, but what's most important is that everyone understands the principles of science and engineering. Um, and we're getting a big crash course in it at the moment with this virus. But um, if you look at the future of work, it's all towards um, those higher skilled positions and background in engineering uh, seems to be critical. And even during this pandemic this year, when we have a huge recession, my Department of Chemical Engineers, the students have all been offered jobs before they've even finished uh, their degree. So even in the worst of economic times, they are still getting snapped up. Uh, so that's a, a pretty good sign of the way things are trending. I'll maybe just add to that and say, there was a survey, a couple, I think a couple of years back and they said, you know, until now uh, you require around say 30% of the jobs out there required STEM skills. Going forward, there'll be up to 70 to 80% of jobs would actually require STEM skills. So not having STEM skills in the future is not really an option and I think to echo what Matt said, it's not the exact particular skills because the jobs of the future don't even exist right now, but it's just setting you up so that you know you have a 30, 40 career old career in front of you, just so that you have the skills to take whatever you know gets thrown in your path for the next 30 to 40 years. Okay, I've got a question from Hayden, um, which is which is a great one. I've been wanting to ask all um, all morning. What what is your favorite part of your job? <laughs> I'll take a moment to, to, to whittle it down to one. <laughs> <laughs> Madhu, did I you can go. To yeah, sure, I can go. I think the one which gives me the most satisfaction is when I manage to convey my research and people actually understand it and appreciate, you know, where it comes from. When people understand what my job is and and appreciate truly, you know, where exactly and appreciate the value which we actually put into our work and where it can actually impact society and make a difference. Seeing that spark of, you know, oh yeah, and I, I get what she's talking about, that light bulb moment go off in them. I think that gives me a lot of satisfaction. Yeah, well, I agree with the same, same for me. Um, but one other thing as well is, um, while our research is very impactful, maybe the most important thing that we do as academics is to help the next generation. And for me, the absolute highlight is when one of my team gets uh, employed by somebody else uh, into, a, into a good role. And, and I had that happen last week, so that was a big celebration uh, to, to see a, a young researcher getting their first job. And uh, that sort of, for me, is, that means I've done my job. So. Um, that's very satisfying as well to, to be helping uh, the next generation coming through. Um, so, well, thank you for answering that question. So, and thank you for the student who asked that question because that was on my list. Um, now, uh, we've got Buwaneka who um, wants to know about uh, getting a job in STEAM and whether it requires high marks in VCE. So we've had a couple of students ask about, you know, how, um, um, how high, you know, do, how high does your ATAR need to be to sort of um, be able to get into STEAM courses and then, you know, what are the job prospects after that? I'll let Matt take this one. I'll go first this, this time. Um, well, I can tell you the, the ATAR for, for Monash Engineering is about 93 uh, at the moment. That's, that's what it was last year. Um, it bounces around. 
it, it certainly does. But if you don't get 93, that doesn't mean you can never be an engineer. Um, it, it, uh, there's many ways of, of doing the training. Uh, there's many universities offering different courses as well. And so um, while it is a high number, it's not a big red stop sign if you don't get it. There's plenty of other ways to, to keep going if you're interested enough. So just to add to that, I think in RMIT, it's anywhere from 85 to 97, just based on the particular branch of engineering. There are certain branches which are more popular than the others. But we also recently have a flexible option where it's, you can kind of enter and then choose your branch of engineering after a year or so. So that one, I think, is quite popular. Great, great advice. Now we've got Kartik who is asking, what is the biggest project that you have been in and how has it affected your perspective on engineering? Uh, I suppose I'll go first. The biggest project uh, that I've been involved in is and one that I'm currently leading where we're making a, a new uh, gas mask uh, so that can filter toxic uh, chemicals but also um, particles like virus particles or radioactive particles. So we're working with the Australian Department of Defence, but also with police, firefighters, factory workers, uh, miners. And if I um, added up everyone who's working on that project, I think I've got up to 11 different organisations that I'm working with. So one of the things I really learned, uh, I think Madhu said this before about with the media work, is how do you communicate something that might be very complicated to somebody who is not from the same training as you are. And that's the most important thing with leading a big project like that, I think, is that you have to be a real all-rounder. You've got to do the, the nerdy technical talk because you are doing all the science and engineering. You're doing that with your, your fellow researchers. But then there's all of your other stakeholders who have very strong training themselves but in something else. And so they won't understand that stuff that they bring a whole bunch of other knowledge that you don't have. So um, that's probably the key learning I have out of running a really big project is, um, is being able to communicate in different languages. Okay. Yep, sure. Uh, so for me, I would say a lot of my projects, I've literally worked my life in three year segments. But I think the biggest one, which is probably the one I'm going to start right now, which is an Australian Research Council Center of Excellence. So it's a seven year program. I've never I've never looked at a seven year cycle before. So seven year program, which is funded by the Australian government, where we're looking at nearly 20, 25 organizations, which are five Australian and 19 international plus industry. And so hoping to bring that together, where it's also straddling different branches of engineering and physics, and also trying to go all the way from fundamental science to the applied. So that will be a big one. Ask me in 2027 as to how that went on. <laughs> Great answer. I will set my alarm for 2027, Margie. <laughs> um, okay, final, final question, um, uh, which is sad because we do have a lot of questions here, but we're also running, um, running a little bit over time, so we can't get to them all today. But um, this one from Ruby, I think, is a great one to finish on, um, which is uh, if there was anything you would like to tell us to inspire us. So um, any sort of like inspirational words for our audience. I mean, you've been, you know, uh, talking a lot for the last one and a half hour and I would find that inspirational, but anything else, I guess, um, final remarks? <laughs> that you I'll can... maybe jump in. Yeah. Um, I think if this year has taught us anything else and nothing else but just this, it's resilience. And I think school students especially have shown incredible resilience in the way you've just, you know, managed to take your entire learning offline off, off the school campus and managed to still try and get the same kind of experience from the school. And that's a trait I've always said is critical for any career, be it STEM or not STEM. So I think this year is, you know, has been a bit, big teaching moment in that particular way. So resilience and perseverance, just with those two and with a lot of passion. I think you'll go wherever you want to go. Sky is the limit, seriously. Over to Matt. Yeah, look, look um, I was totally right. Uh, there's an old quote that's been getting used too much lately, which is never waste a crisis. 
And, uh, you know, those of you who are at school have just had many, many years of training and education squeezed into one bit uh, around all of the other skills that you need to succeed at university and, and in your career around dealing with unexpected things occurring and finding a way to succeed. And it might not be much fun now, but you'll be really glad that you went through that in a couple of years' time because you'll be set up uh, to keep going uh, and really have more success once we get to the other side of this thing. So, yeah, just say congratulations and, and keep going. Very important word. Thank you so much, Madhu. Thank you so much for that. And thank you, everyone, for asking is curious, um, who is passionate, who is a self-proclaimed nerd um, in science, technology, engineering, maths, and, and the creative arts, can I recommend that you check in the references section and apply to be part of the Curious Advisory Group at Science Gallery Melbourne, which is part of the University of Melbourne. So that link is in the references section that you can see at the top of your screen there. Um, yes. So that is all we have time for today. Um, I do want to give another big thank you to our speakers and engineers who we've got to know so well, I feel, over the last hour and a half. Professor Marju Baskaran and Associate Professor Matt Hill, thank you so much for spending this time with us today. Um, and a big thank you to Camille Thompson and the team from the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering. And once again, pat on the back to everyone watching here today. Um, there is a lot of online content out there and you're doing all your classes online as well. So being engaged as, um, as, as much as everyone was today um, has been really inspiring for us um, presenting to you today. So thank you again. Um, and we hope that you leave today uh, a bit more inspired, a bit more curious and certainly excited for your future. Um, I know I am. So thank you again and see you soon. We started off with really basic components that you can learn how to use on Google and, and YouTube. I started cold calling schools. I didn't even have a website, a business card or even a proper business name. I didn't know that I was going to be a seaweed farmer. You're researching and talking about seaweed production but you never really knew it was me that was going to do it. I felt like there were problems in business and industry that were slowing me down, like too many protocols, too many pathways, too much risk aversion. When I started the business, it opened up a whole new dimension of learning and experiences around entrepreneurship and how you actually translate some of that research into, into business and into the real world to go and implement it. And that was really exciting. Branching out and starting your own company is, is not the norm for science. And in a country like Australia, there's some really good incentives to do it. Science can talk about how we should do things or the theory of what might happen if we do this but it's actually getting out there and doing it that will make the difference. I think the best part of my job is that when someone asks you what a typical day look like, it's so hard to answer. Um, and it's because it's so varied, which is so exciting. Working with people, leading teams, negotiating, technical knowledge, so product development, you know, legal. Whatever problem comes up that day, you've got to work out how to solve it. My advice to everybody is to find a niche that they love and find a way in which there's a pathway that they can actually see that becoming a skill or a job that they want to do in the future and apply themselves to that. So you've got to love what you do, even though you're challenged by it. And you've got to be challenged by what you love, otherwise life is very, very boring. In entrepreneurship, we talk about this concept called finding your tribe. If you're interested in something, there are a lot of other people in the world who are also interested in it too. It's super fun, you get to work with the, the person that you pick to work with and, and you get to work on something that's, that you get to direct how it goes. There's a lot of stories about, you know, when you're in business or you're an entrepreneur that you've got to hustle and, you know, you've got to be that big extroverted personality, but, you know, that's not me. And I think if I can just be myself, if I'm genuine in my values and my behaviour, 
then that can also allow me to thrive in this environment of being a business owner. When you can really see how much other people appreciate the work that you're putting in, just knowing that I'm making an impact and that I'm, I'm doing everything that I can to, to leave the world in a better place, it makes it all worth it.